Welcome to another episode of the Doomer Optimism Podcast. My name is Donald. I'm an occasional first-time host, and I'm joined today by Ashley Colby, who is a uh, many-time host, not for the first time, and uh, uh, one of the founders of the podcast. And we have with us today Blake Smith, whom I will tell you nothing about, but he's going to introduce himself. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Blake Smith. Uh, I'm a historian and literary translator. I work mostly on modern France. Um, I'm currently a, a Fulbright scholar in North Macedonia, which has no connection to that. Um, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. I'm from the high school that the movie The Blind Side was made about. Um, that used to be a more useful reference, but that was like 15 years ago or something. Uh, but that's still the that's still the only sort of cultural touchstone for uh, like my my childhood. Um, and otherwise, I live uh, in Chicago. Oh, I should add, so I've never have... said this on the podcast, Donald. Um, I am from the high school of Jenny McCarthy. Chicago, all girls Catholic high school. Oh. So first time reveal on on the Doomer Optimism podcast, my my touchstone. Wow, this is big news. We're <laughs> we're only a few minutes in, and big news is already coming out. Uh, so this is a three continent discussion. Um, like like good localists, we are um, <laughs> spanning the globe. And <clears throat> so, Blake, I was going to start off by asking where you're from, but you've already said that a little bit. Um, uh from from memphis tennessee <clears throat> so why don't we start off what are you doing in north macedonia um right so i had a four-year appointment at the university of chicago that um ended this summer and uh if if anyone is uh you know in the academic world and is thinking of what to do um there are fulbrights to all of the balkan countries that no one applies for um, so for like Macedonia, there, there are a couple every year. Sometimes they literally have no one applying. Um, and I have a, a friend here who is Macedonian and, um, uh, you know, teaches literature at the, the main university in the country and had been telling me, you know, come apply. Um, so here I am, um, I'm doing some workshops with, um, grad students and faculty on like writing articles and preparing grant applications in English. And otherwise, I'm working on um, the very beginning of a book project on Roland Bart on love, which has nothing to do with Macedonia, has nothing to do with um, probably our conversation uh, today. Uh, but you know, love is important. Uh, I'm trying to think about that. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it could be somehow that uh, yeah, it, it does circle around in the sense that I mean, Bart thinks already in the '70s that there's a a real problem with modernity or post-modernity in the sense that we can't take love intellectually seriously. It's not something that like is central to our main intellectual theoretical discourses. And it's also something that as an experience, like personally, we're having more and more trouble um, really giving its proper seriousness. So, I mean, that we, we think a lot since the sixties and seventies about, um, desire about sexual desire and about recognition from other people but we don't think very much about our ability to love to you know give and receive love as a essential capacity that could be you know degraded um by by things that are happening socially and politically mm. has um has your thinking shifted at all being in macedonia does the place where we are change how we think um right it, it seems like the a good answer would be yes i mean i'm i but i mean one i i'm not i'm i'm neither very sure what the relationship between where we are and what our thinking in general is um nor do i i'm i'm not sure if it would be good to have like clarity about the conditions of one's own thinking, you know? Um, so, I mean, one of the things I find kind of weird about like academic writing, like you do an academic monograph and you have at the beginning the acknowledgements, um, as if it would be possible to say, like, I know all the people to whom I have debts and here they all are 
and this is what they're like, and this is the order, and then the most important people are at the end, and you know, like I I know how it all fits together. Um, I mean, I think you know, so like John Cage, who like I mean, not that I think is sort of like plinkety plunk weirdo music is good, but he has this line that I really like where he's like, uh, I'm trying to be unfamiliar with what I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. So I sometimes think like. You know, I spent a lot of the last several years, like um, I had a like, similar, like kind of weird fellowships, like in Iceland and Romania and, and in Italy, where I was working on like French stuff, right? So no co connection to like what was, you know, the place that I was in. Um, and it's kind of nice, like, right? Like, um, you know, like like today, uh, there was like traffic everywhere um, because the president or prime minister of Albania is in town. Um, and like, I don't know who that is. I didn't know, like, for most of the day why there was traffic. Um, and it's very freeing, right? Like, I then, you know, I can just think about sort of, um, like, I, think, I can think about love, right? I can think about, like, Roland Barthes in 1975. And I'm, no one is asking me, like, oh, did you hear about the news? What do you think about this? No one cares what I think about, like, American politics. No one cares what I think about local politics. Um, <laughs> I mean, I I don't know, Ashley. Maybe you've been like in Argentina now long enough, to, or or Uruguay. Uruguay, right? yeah, yeah. Uruguay. Um, that that people expect you to have like thoughts, um, but I kind of like that. You know, you go to a new place and you're just there for, you know, a limited amount of time, and uh, you're allowed to be kind of a doofy foreigner and and assume this kind of it is like oh, huh, huh, uh, I don't know, um. <laughs> And yeah, th th there's something that's uh, liberating about that. Yeah, I, I just want to reflect that. Um, I think there is something in our little, like we're, we're always talking about this on Doom or Optimism, like the Cosmo local idea, like where we do have things we care about, like locally in our material lives, but then we're also interested in these other things that may or may not really relate they're just like interests we have and we follow them um the people in the doomer optimism sphere i'm referring to and it's kind of liberating to not have everything be so all-encompassing about your life and experience and work and the things you care about um you can just kind of dabble in a lot of things at once and some so just recently something similar happened to me in in this small town i think the town is like a hundred people nearby to us they have a um annual marching of the torches through the streets of the town to commemorate the founding of the town and the president came the president of uruguay came and and i was like what's that swarm of people over there and it was just him and i just walked up like you know three feet away and just snapped a picture like like i think one security guy you know it was like i i don't even know <laughs> like i i have no frame of reference for that experience it was so, such a weird thing um but it, is, it was nice to just be like the doofy foreigner going up to people being like that was the president and they're like yeah he comes to stuff you know <laughs> it's not really that big of a deal <laughs> yeah and you don't and you don't have to like have a position about him you know you don't have to have like right um like right i mean for sure if i see like Lori lightfoot in chicago or even if she comes up in conversation i have to like I know the other person has some opinion and I have to be like, oh yeah, she sucks. Or like, oh, well, she's doing her best, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Um, and yeah, here, like I can just be totally opaque. Like, oh yes, Albania. Yes. <laughs> I have, I've tried to cultivate a similar approach to American politics. Yeah. Mostly through just um, being deeply ignorant. <laughs> like gun to my head, I, I don't know what con congressional districts I'm in. Like if if it was if I had if I was forced to say who my congressman was, I would just die because I there's it's no I don't even it's nowhere in my head I could not register I just have no idea I know who the governor is of Washington because one of my neighbors on his truck has the image of Calvin peeing on his name on every single like side of the truck the same image you Do know they still make those. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've always appreciated wow. that he's like, oh, I don't, this is not just going to be a bumper sticker. I'm going to make this on every, <laughs> so no matter what direction you look at my vehicle, you'll know that I really dislike the guy, you know? I, um, I but anyway, I, uh, Calvin I found Calvin King or a Jesus great. fish in, I don't know how long. <laughs> oh, yeah, we see, we, I see him, like the Darwin fish, Jesus fish, sure, yeah. Um but anyway, I, you know, I, I've never registered to vote. And so I, it's um, 
It's great. Uh, so you can live the carefree life of Ashley and Blake wherever you are, even if you don't leave your your um, home country. You just uh, and it's actually people appreciate it when you when they start talking about it, and then you're just like, I, I don't care. I'm no, I have no opinion for the most part, at least where I live. No, that doesn't bother anybody. Um, oh, gosh, but the reason I Blake. <clears throat> The reason that we uh, wanted to have you on is, uh, I as I watched you on a um, a panel about Christopher Lash, who I always thought was it was called his name was Christopher Lash, but I was um, disabused of that hearing his, evil his biographer yeah. pronounce his name, <laughs> and uh, and I found your thoughts really interesting and relevant to what we've been trying to do here, Doomer Optimism. Maybe we'll get into that about thinking through what we're trying to do. And I think you could maybe be a helpful corrective to us in some ways. Um, and the, your talks in that panel, I think you've, you've reworked now into an article on um, on Unheard. So we'll link to that so everyone can see what we're talking about. Um, and I, I, was re, I was reading the preface to Lash's Minimal Self the other day, and I was just struck by how the you know, book was written 40 years ago, but how 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 contemporary it felt how um it it seemed to really speak to what we've been trying to do um and um i think mean, lash is not a name that's come up in our discussions much in zoom or optimism but i think he probably ought to um like yvonne illich and Wendell Berry and some other people uh come up more often but i think that lash is sort of part of a similar to Illich in my mind um and that they were very popular writers in their time and then kind of disappeared and have been made 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 a resurgence so uh, I'm curious to talk about uh, what drew you to his writing um and then also to kind of figure out what your deal is like you've been like reading your articles like you you seem really fascinated by these 20th century critical defenders of liberalism Judith Sklar Christopher Lash, Leo Strauss, um, and others. Uh, but before we figure out the Blake Smith project as a whole, let's let's start let's start with Christopher Lash and what yeah what um, how you came to his writing, uh, and then then we can talk specifically about what you said on that panel and wrote in your article. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. So my, my, um, first exposure to Lash was in college. Um, so I went to Hendricks college, Arkansas's finest liberal arts college, um, which no one outside of Arkansas has heard of. Um, and a guy that I was sort of friends with, um, or who, you know, I thought was like intellectually interesting, but, um, too, too out there and like druggy for me to really you know connect with um got really into lash and then had this kind of sort of lashian journey himself like he went on this kind of uh rightward political trip um after college he became i think like a welder or like some trade in the pacific northwest um became kind of an alcoholic um because it turns out like everyone says like go do a trade go do a trade but a lot of those guys are living um, you know, not, not healthy lives, um, was, you know, kind of into Trump and Bannon in like 2015, 2016. Um, and I think now is doing better. I think now, I think, I, I think I heard he's with a woman. Um, and, and Casey, if you're listening, I hope you're doing well. Um, and I mean, one, like that was interesting to me because I didn't know anyone in that era of like the late 2000s, early 2010s, who was like, on that trip, right? Like in, in some ways, this guy Casey was like, you know, several years early to this this party. Um, and at the time, I mean, um, I was still like, I mean, I, I had grown up with, um, you know, suburban Republican evangelical parents. Um, and so college, you know, like, uh, you know, experiment like libertarianism, Maoism, whatever. Um, and then I think 
came out kind of a typical left liberal grad student left. Um, and yeah, then for several years, like didn't hear anyone talk about Lash. Like I assume this was like, this is a weird thing that this one guy I went to college with was into, but like not part of some broader intellectual trend. And it's like Ross Douthat was Lash's only prominent guy, I think. Like yeah, wrote an I, introduction to a new edition of cultural culture of narcissism and was kind of a a lash promoter, but other than that, he just didn't come up. And and you know, I I don't read the New York Times. I don't like anyone with the New York Times. Um, I don't like Douthat. Um, I, and, and certainly until like recently, I I didn't keep up at all with like conservative media. You know, I mean, I you know have no. Um, you were better so for think, it. <laughs> Well, I, I I don't know what I was uh, uh, I mean, probably just drinking and you know with, with grad school people, uh, but where is this going? Um, but yeah, then then maybe like 2019, 2020, it seemed like suddenly he's everywhere. Like you know, like the the Red Scare ladies have decided that he must be talked about, and everyone is you know uh, performing their familiarity with the culture of narcissism, um, and a, a thing that I don't really like about myself necessarily but is is an energy i try to use from my writing is that if if i if i feel somehow some like imperative that like oh you should read this like people are reading then then my intuition is that like oh this is probably terrible like i hate it like stop telling me what to do um, like and this is this is maybe just like a you know the part of me that never got over being like a a teenager um like you can't tell me that lash is great um so for a while like i you know, just like not interested. And then in 2020, like, uh, we all had a lot of time on our hands. <laughs> um, so I like, it's like, okay, well, you know, I'm really not doing anything. Um, I guess I have no excuse not to like read the culture of narcissism. Um, and, and for some reason, like, after that, I, I thought I should, yeah, read the minimal self. I mean, I think maybe another like perverse intellectual thing is like the the unpopular book that a popular person has like that's mm -hmm. going to be the interesting one right like oh you know people are talking about x but they're not talking about y um and i really didn't like it like i really you know i still i still think like especially the first half of minimal self is really um it's just it feels like a lot of scattered notes and um it's not, I think, as well written the way the culture of narcissism is actually really well written. Um, and so kind of put it out of my mind for a while. And then as I had been doing some writing throughout 2020 about um, Foucault and, and COVID biopolitics, like um, at that time, I was really interested in using Foucault to think about, um, you know, how weird it is that a whole generation of people like Foucault is one of the most assigned authors in social science classes. So like millions of Americans have read Foucault. Everyone who's gone to college basically has read Foucault. And suddenly like all of these people, the sort of college educated, you know, bourgeois uh, strata um, are doing the most un Foucaultian thing, which is like embracing like really illiberal um, health measures. Um, even while they're like theoretically really committed to this kind of critical project. Um, so I was like rereading him and writing about that. And then what started me writing on, on Lash is thinking about the, the connections between the two of them, because actually like, um, I think this is still true of most editions of uh, Birth of the Clinic and History of Sexuality in the US are blurbed by Christopher Lash, because Christopher Lash was one of the first people to review their English translations in um, like major magazines. And Lash like brought Foucault to, to a conference in the US, I think at the University of Vermont in 82. Um, and they have actually a lot of things in common. Like they have a similar critique of expertise, of therapy, um, a suspicion of the progressive welfare state, um, of elites um, toward the end of their life. I mean, they, they, both, they both die like in their mid sixties, uh, 10 years apart. Um, but in the last years of both of their lives, they have this kind of turn to religion, where they're thinking about religion as a as a resource for um, self-making, for preserving um, 
autonomous communities. Um, they both, you know, come from this Marxist tradition, but are also, you know, critical of, of uh, Orthodox Marxism. They're engaged with the Frankfurt School. Um, so that was really what led me to get on to Lash, like to, to make me think like, okay, well now I found like my own way of appreciating Lash. Mm. Um, and then like the, the, like many people who, you know, really annoy us. And then like, we, we sort of sit with them. It turns out like they're right about something and we can then like use what they were right about in other ways. So then like, I've, I've written a number of pieces that are sort of, um, inspired by this idea that there's a real sort of psychosocial problem with the way um, subjectivity is constituted now with the way that like people's character is, is, is uh, developed. Um, so I, I've written a couple pieces for like city journal thinking about both for like ordinary people in their political um, thinking and our, our, our elites, people like Trump or AOC or Pelosi, um, that we really are prisoners of a kind of narcissistic self-image that prevents us from working together toward our rational and best interest. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Lash is often used kind of descriptively to say like, oh, we are indeed in this culture of narcissism or, or kind of polemically to say like you, like other people are in a culture of narcissism. Um, but what I like about minimal self is that, um, and here Lash seems to be most thinking about, well, okay, if it's true that because of our like social economic conditions, um, there is this newly kind of insecure, lonely, vulnerable person who is really toxically invested in their self-image. Like that that becomes this kind of cultural capital and also this economic capital, right? I mean, and and I mean it's truer now than um it was even in the 80s, right? Because like companies will go looking at your social media, right? Or like before I decide to date you, I'm gonna look at your Instagram. So like this this image of yourself that you project really is like actually essential to your your material survival, uh your ability to get a job, your ability to get a partner. Um, it's it's not like a wicked moral decision to be narcissistic. It's really um, something that is thrust upon us by the, the, the way that our society is. Um, and that that's not something that we can just denounce our way out of. We have to think like, okay, if people are being shaped in this way. What political possibilities are there to shape them otherwise? Um, and it, it it seems to me that a lot of people on the left are also like have been interested in that in, in the last few years. So I'd written some similar pieces thinking about like, there's this guy, Benjamin Fong, who I mentioned in the, the piece for Unheard um, at Arizona State University, who wrote a, a really good book in 2016, uh, Death and Mastery, uh, <laughs> thinking about these issues with um, like Adorno and Horkheimer. And um, like in the French tradition, there's this guy, uh, Jean-Claude Michéa, who has written prefaces to the translations of Lash in French, and he's like a old school communist. Um, I think, yeah, there, there are a lot of people who see this kind of psychic dysfunction as the primary problem of our time, um, because it it doesn't make sense. You know, I think that this is their argument, and this, this is you know something I agree with. Um, X or Y if the way that we're wired right now prevents us from actually translating our needs into rational collective action. Um, so, I mean, we, we've seen, you know, like you can, you can somehow get some insurgent populist leader from the left or the right into power, but then like they seem unable to do anything and their supporters seem unable to hold them to account or to recognize that things are going really poorly. Um, so like, I mean, it's not just that Trump once elected doesn't, doesn't do anything as he said he would, but like, you know, my parents are super Trump people and like, should, they seem unaware that it's gone wrong, like in, in their own terms, right. That like, they didn't get the things that they wanted. Um, and so I think where Lash's later work, um, for me, like go, goes awry is that I, you know, I, I don't know how useful 
populism is uh, oh. as a solution. That that to me seems more of like those just sort of injunctions. Like it would be good if people were different, but you know, it it, it what I think is good in his his later work is the idea that um, the essential problem is one of how people are being subjectified, like how people are being made into um, certain kinds of subjects. And I think it, when we step back and frame the problem in those kind of really meta and general terms, then a lot of people, both on the right and the left, are people who have all kinds of different ideals for what a good society might be like or what a good life might be like, can agree that like, oh, indeed, there is this like real problem with the way that people are being shaped. Um, and I mean, maybe this is this is you know kind of an optimistic fantasy, but uh, my hope would be like on on those grounds, there would be maybe new possibilities of conversations with different people, new kinds of coalitions, um, for what what Fong calls uh, a, a politics that makes politics possible again. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So, um, I, I mean, basically, I want to just dig into what that actually would look like. And I can't tell in your article, <laughs> I don't know if we should try to describe what Doomer Optimism kind of seems to be shaping up to be, Donald, or not. But um, I can't tell from your article whether or not you completely agree with us or completely disagree. <laughs> so I need to, like, <laughs> we need to, like, dig into it because it, the, the title of your article is What Christopher Lash Got Wrong, no, Nostalgia's No Cure for Populism. Um... But I think. I, by the way, I, I I didn't I didn't write the, the title. Yeah, or yeah. Subtitle. I don't know what the subtitle even means. Okay, so okay, that okay. One's, <laughs> All right, so that's so you'll get a pass on that. Yeah, and her does pick the the um, headlines for you. But then, hey, um, Ashley. Yeah. Before I before we get into the what the meta politics actually is. Yeah. And and whether or not it, doomer optimism is the answer that Blake has been waiting for. Right which it might just be. Um, I thought maybe we could first try to, to figure out a little bit about what Lash's like, understanding or criticism of things is a little bit more. And then yeah, yeah go for it. Maybe yeah, yeah. you could lay out what doom or optimism is and, and Blake could um, uh, respond, respond. And so um. I was going to read something, if I could, from yeah. the preface to the minimal self, specifically about narcissism, which I think is an easily confused term. And part of the purpose of this book is for Lash to, to he's writing this after the culture of narcissism, and he's responding to critics who he didn't understand it. And I think this 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 chunk of text I was like, this could have been written yesterday. It's sort of remarkable. This is 1984, but... Um, Okay, as the Greek legend reminds us, it is this confusion of the self and the not-self, not egoism, that distinguishes the plight of Narcissus. The minimal or narcissistic self is, above all, a self uncertain of its own outlines, longing either to remake the world in its own image or to merge into its environment in blissful union. The current concern with identity registers some of this difficulty in defining the boundaries of selfhood. So does the minimalist style in contemporary art and literature, which derives much of its subject matter from popular culture, in particular from the invasion of experiences by images, and thus helps us to see the minimal that minimal selfhood is not just a, de a defensive response to danger, but arises out of a more fundamental social transformation, the replacement of a reliable world of durable objects by a world of flickering images that make it harder and harder to distinguish reality from fantasy. Do you want to do a, sh a couple sentence takeaway from that, Donald, for you? Well, I thought what he said about identity was particularly interesting. That narcissism, it's not egoism, it's not, a, it's not the <laughs> enlargement of self, but it's the disintegration of the self into the world. The, the the failure to distinguish between self and world. And I think that a lot of contemporary identity stuff is just that. I'm not a self, but I'm part of these cat I, I merge myself with these sociological categories. Um 
like Blake, you mentioned this a little bit in your Sklar piece about how, every, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you can come up with the list of identities that I guess I would be pigeonholed into and that I can dissolve myself into them. Um, I don't know. Is that how you read it, Blake? Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> part part of the like contemporary or postmodern narcissism, yes, uh, wanting this coherent self image. That yeah, I mean, you you could think of it as um, something that I can force on the world, or that I can have the world like fuse into it. Um, but you know that it it's not just the case that um, I go to work and I'm myself at work, or I go to church and I'm myself at church. Um, but that you know what what what's the phrase that I can be my whole self at work, right? That like all of me can be visible, and this all of me ends up being a really like limited, packaged, narrow thing because of course that's the only thing that could be like visible at all times. Um, but in the way like you know I mean just before leaving. Um, Chicago this spring, um, the Institute, and now there's like, you know, uh, I can see all of my students' pronouns, um, the the health insurance through the university, like I can tell them my, uh, like my biological sex, my gender, my sexual orientation, um, my religion, um, like all of these things that like, you know, um, I don't, you know, I don't want to be on, on a list um you know when like they decide to round up like whoever on whatever basis like i i don't want to be like available in that way but the the contemporary demand really is like um uh, uh, a wish not to have to compartmentalize but to have this um small simple image of me that i can take anywhere right that i can like project out into public and have recognized that i can take to work um, that I can take to school. Um, and I think it's a, you know, a, a wish maybe to overcome like the the complexity of a contemporary life where we are like shuttled between many different roles in a way that can feel really inhuman. So it's a way of like trying to reconstitute like a holistic, authentic self, but in this shallow and aggressive kind of way um and then like demanding that like strangers must recognize it and affirm it um because maybe i don't like have people in my life who actually give me a kind of you know satisfying um affirmation of of, of my real self um yeah i mean i think what what what's um critical about what lash is doing and here he he's similar also to this sort of french collective from the late 90s um Tikkun that has um, a couple of books like uh, Notes Toward a Theory of a Young Girl or um, a Bloom Theory, um, where they're thinking about what's both um, apparently shallow and self-absorbed, but also really like um, aggressive and vulnerable about modern subjectivity. So it's not it's not like the rational, calculating, self-interested ego. Where I'm thinking, like, I just want to, I just want to get what's best for me, um, but it's really, um, yeah, these kinds of totalizing demands for validation, like from everyone, um, and that, yeah, that's something that's really unique. But it's not validation of the self, is what's strange. It's the self becomes absorbed into a category, and then it's demanding validation for the category. Of which we you just become an avatar. That's what I find like uh so fascinating about it. Is that there's not it's not individual at all. It's always as a blah blah blah. Like I was not recognized as a such and such category that but it's never, you know, the an actual self actual selfhood is, you know, relational. And personal, right? Is it, you know, I'm the daughter or son of so and so. I'm from this place. I'm friends with him. I live here. I'm, you know, it's it's relational and it's not can't be reduced in that way. Um 
but this is a it's like a it's a dissolution of the self or a merging of the self with these um well uh, uh, so i mean categories. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we we sort of have come to take it for granted that people have a kind of mastery over their categories right so like i tell you what my categories are and then um like how i expect to be affirmed with them um <laughs> so like the in a way the category gives me individually more leverage um and right like i i can't i can't be affirmed in public as my unique self right like i mean whether or not there is like a unique self in this way I means this is a different question but like um i i can't go around like asking people to recognize like blake smith and his blake smithness you know they don't they don't know me and like maybe i don't know me um but i can say like as an x as a y um like that's you know that's something that i can like take to different sites and like make demands based on um but if you live in a place where people actually know each other it's actually yeah. pretty normal to be recognized as a relational per like as a relational person and not as a category like in a lot of places in the world it's completely normal to un to introduce somebody and to immediately oh you're the son of so and so oh you're the grandson of so and so you know i went to high school with your dad but that 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 web of relationship is exactly how people are recognized yeah and i would just i mean growing up in southwest ohio and i'm sorry ashley you haven't really said anything so i'm gonna back away but my i have so many experiences of uh my my dad and his sister were on were serious swimmers and so i have so many experiences growing up of meeting people and the first thing they would say is oh i swam with your dad mm. or i swam with your aunt and that was how they recognized me was in a relational way even though they were a total stranger to me it was or i knew your grandpa or whatever um uh but the 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 further away we are from you know obviously if you live in probably like chicago or new york city that sort of relationship is impossible i think it, at one point those cities were so neighborhood yeah. Or even block by still block are, focus yeah. that it still yeah, was. And still Ashley, are. you grew up in Chicago. You could speak to this a little bit. Yeah. But even in big cities, that sort of re relational recognition was how people um, saw each other. But okay. Ashley, yeah, yeah. I'm, yes. I've talked a lot. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this just reminds me of I think something we preach a lot over and over again with humor optimism is like, um, the importance of interdependence. So there's like the on the one extreme like this almost spreadsheet brain alienation which is like the only way i can be known to others is to like self-determine a category and then make the rest of the world conform to this like idea that i've developed of myself usually those kind of categories are just developed in the in some like weird in-group culture that like nobody really understands from the out group and then you're trying to like put um that on people i went to this conference like five years ago um where it was the the pronoun thing was new and I, there was an older british guy like in the room sitting next to me who was like in his 60s and the woman leading it um said like you know say what your pronouns are and he like leaned to me and was like i don't know i don't understand like, what that question is and it was like this perfect example of like yeah there's some weird in-group culture that just like starts in some niche thing and you're just like putting that on the out outside as a way of um you know I, I guess supposedly making yourself known to the other but really you're just kind of imposing a kind of ideology of your own like way of, of of making your identity as opposed to um figuring out what your identity is to the other person is a kind of like um love or care for them like how can i find myself or how can i explain myself or introduce myself to you in a way that like makes sense to you um is like an exercise in interdependence and like um not uh, the opposite of narcissism you know really thinking like you know how can i mold myself to make you know to 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 meet you where you're at basically as opposed to you know alienating this older british guy who doesn't have any idea what this culture is or what you're talking about um in the name of like inc inclusivity um so yeah i mean i guess on that note like let's talk about the politics that make politics possible does it ha have to do with interdependence like this um let's let's dig into it 
Yeah. Um, so what I think, you know, what, what Lash seems to come to in the early 90s is <clears throat> a kind of, maybe this is uncharitable, like a, a sort of moralizing appeal to populist traditions. That doesn't strike me as really um, like intellectually coherent, um, given like like his commitment still to a kind of Marxism. Um, and it doesn't strike me as like particularly useful or, or personally appealing. Um, so for those haven't who haven't read your unheard article, you put it pretty clearly why you think that's the case. But could you just describe why what the contradiction is? Yeah. So, um, you know, to the extent that Lash is a Marxist, like the <clears throat> the populist ideology of uh, local elites, of, you know, hardworking middle class, middle Americans in the 19th and early 20th century who value, you know, his, these are his words, like discipline and competence and hard work and family and, you know, going to church. Um, well, you know, that was probably a more or less rational set of beliefs and practices in an economy that was dominated by small farms and artisanal production and then and then in different ways in the mid 20th century um dominated by you know factory work and and unions um although maybe across that time um you know things like uh you know patriarchal family and sexual repression and protestant work ethic were mostly beneficial to elites who could preach these uh, to to other people to extract uh, work from them. Um, now, um, those are not the values that at least are useful for our elites to preach to us, right? Um, and we live in really different economic circumstances. Um, and like a sort of problem with the whole uptake of Lash in recent years is like, I think everyone, um, you know, is more or less sympathetic to like the fact that there's a, a problem with narcissism and that it's related to our economic circumstances that we live in this increasingly virtual economy. Uh, we live in a, a post-industrial society. Um, most of us spend a lot of our time both at work and at leisure um, manipulating images and symbols and having virtually mediated relationships that are you know, premised on our identities and our performance of categories. Um, and that's not something that most of us can just opt out of, right? I mean, that's not, um, uh, and, and even the people who might seem to be opting out of it, you know, like if you're doing some like cottage core Instagram, you know, you're like, in fact, performing how you've opted out of it on, on the same networks. Um, so the, the trouble would be like thinking of a way of getting to whatever the next set of economic arrangements is from within our existing economic arrangements and from within our existing psychological conditions, right? So if, if our economic and social conditions are making particularly shitty kinds of people, which that seems fair, <laughs> um, well, you know, as, as, as Obama said, right? Like we're, we're the change that we've been, like it's, you know, it's only us, like we're the only instruments that we have available. So we have to find like some kind of psychic resources within ourselves to start the work of um, you know, collective self-improvement. Um, I mean, what what is it in the way that things are economically and socially that isn't necessary? Like what, what could be different? Um, you know, I, I think um, there are certain fantasies about like reindustrialization, about getting back to real jobs. Um, I only follow this a little bit. This is, this is kind of like a, an, an unhealth. Like I, I follow it just enough to be unhealthy, but not enough to learn something. But the the way that people got really mad at these TikTok videos about like women with high paying like email jobs that like um, oh we know, can Facebook. go down that rabbit hole if you want. But everyone knows those are made by HR departments, right? Those are recruitment videos for college grads. Well, but at, at any rate, I, I I saw a lot of people who were like. You know, sure. I hate these women. I hate their fake jobs. This is why things are going so poorly. People need to get back into coal mines or whatever. Um, and I don't like 
I don't know that America needs more coal mines and, and fewer HR jobs. Um, I think for the economy we have, maybe indeed it is like rational to be a kind of image manipulating narcissist rather than like a someone who's willing to put in a 16 hour day in the mine because you feel like your race is superior to other races and you're better than women and you know you can beat your kids and you know it's 1955 and all this is is permitted if you're a hardworking straight white guy. Um, so right, so the politics that makes politics possible again would somehow be leveraged. Can we pause? For, actually, yeah. Do you so? Do you think that the 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 Marxist the, the brief Marxist history of America? Do you think that's accurate? Um, uh, in 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 like what in in terms of what I just said or what? Yeah, you just described a kind of. Marxist account of American history, where these shifts in American culture are a kind of conspiracy of the elite to make make uh, the American working class fit into whatever the current economic arrangement is. Um, I, I, I don't think it's a it's a conspiracy, but I think you know the the way the economy is um, throughout history usually mostly benefits elites or, or disproportionately benefits elites. Um, elites naturally have an interest in defending that order and in preaching a certain set of values to other people. Um, and those values have to be like, they have to work well enough that society doesn't collapse, you know? So like it's, it, and it, it's true that like in the early and mid 20th century, like, you know, we needed to send people to the factories. So we have to be saying like, you know, being punctual is important and you should stop drinking so much. And, you know, um, like you, you should be a certain kind of person. Like these are the values that we need. And in return for following those values, you'll have certain guarantees. Like, you know, the people who follow them, the people who can be like the normative kind of subject will get certain legal privileges and cultural privileges, and they'll be treated better than other kinds of people. Um, and now, can we frame American history in the sort of opposite way, where if you look at elites in the early 20th century America, they many of them were very enthusiastic about the the Russian experiment, um, the Soviet Union, very excited about avant-garde art and about dabbling in drugs and promiscuity, and that the um, the sort of uh, popular or populist hero, like if you look at who are the heroes of the 20th century now, all the communists are heroes. They have movies made about them, how horrible they were put on blacklist were the sort of populist anti-communist figures are uh, reviled um, and that that uh, that the elite have actually what they've preached is sort of uh, oftentimes the opposite of what you described. Um, and there's been a I counter. But, but, but that, if you think anyway. about like, I mean, of course, there there's always like multiple strands of opinion, right? So it, I mean, this precisely because it's not a conspiracy. Um, mm -hmm. The elites don't all get together and say, like, this is our set of ideas. Um, but, I mean, if you think about, like, progressive era reformers, right, who are trying to uh, eliminate corruption in city politics, who are trying to uh, promote eugenics, who are uh, promoting prohibition, you know, they want a, a better, disciplined, healthier workforce. Um, not And not in, like, a sinister way. Like, it's it's not as though they're saying, like, and this will make me more money, ha-ha. But, you know, in the same way, right, like, you know, all business schools are promoting now, like, entrepreneurship and leadership and diversity because those, in fact, are values that fit well into the current instantiation of capitalism, being like a self-directed, hardworking, tolerant, um, you know, liberal-minded in a certain way kind of subject. Um, you know, and, and of course, there's always disagreement within the elite, but... I mean, I, this this is sort of a, a debate on its own, but yeah, I, I kind of take like the economic base shapes, you know, people's um, uh, incentives uh, for for their beliefs, right? I mean, there's always going to be debate and people who believe different things, um, but you know, for the most part, like elites are going to believe things that make sense for them to believe and they're going to encourage other people to believe things that are in elites interest to believe yeah um, um i want i i i think this is generally a 
um, reasonable uh, theory for us to at least settle on for the moment so that I can hear what is the politics that makes politics possible, because then I want to push back on the um, on the um, the coal mine example and and other various examples, because I do think there we'll, we'll get into it. But I think part of what doomer optimism is trying to do is like maybe something meta modern, like some kind of barbell strategy where it's like you don't have to give up um, email jobs, but you can still have some like meaningful work to and connection to mater the material world and like physical reality that provides meaning in a way that's that could potentially shape your psychology um, and does. And I could talk a little bit about my own experience, but let's hear um, your theory. What like what's the theory of change and then right. um, get debate. <laughs> so I'm, I'm working. I won't interrupt. OK, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm working now um, finishing a manifesto or uh, a, a, I'm not supposed to not call the manifesto a blueprint for uh, American affairs for the spring of next year with um, Michael Quenco, who has written for American Affairs, American Conservative, and some other venues, um, calling for a strong national state that can guide economic policy. Um, and our, our argument is that it's not just good to have such a thing in terms of the possibility of reindustrialization, um, taxing the hell out of the top 1%, the top 10%, um, both because it would be good to have that money redirected to other purposes and because it's sort of morally bad for such people to exist, <laughs> to have money to throw around on their on their pet projects, um, to control labor markets and immigration. Um, so you know, our, our argument is that on the one hand, it's good to have this kind of uh, powerful nationalist uh, state that can direct economic policy in order to make people's lives uh, more predictable, like less subject to the fluctuations of global capitalism, but also that in its mastery of the economy, the state not only like improves material conditions, improving in the sense of you know, making them maybe more abundant, but also just more more regular, um, but also models what psychic life ought to be like. Like it, it models that like, oh, in five years, we expect like these growth targets to be met. Like we expect there to be this, this, and this. Um, I mean, it, it might seem weird like uh, for me to be praising five-year plans, but I, I think in fact, the, the idea that the state can say, um, it, you know, as Kennedy did, like by the end of the decade, we'll put a man on the moon. That's our plan. Like we have we have a collective objective. We're going to figure out how to do it. And then if we fail, like we've told you what the objective is, so you'll know if we failed. Um, instead of the state being committed indefinitely to maximal but undefined GDP growth, right? Like we're just going to try to keep meeting the highest possible targets per year, you know, the way that um, a large company would. Um, that seems like you know, not not only a recipe for screwing up people's lives the way that like the the, the state over the last forty years has done. Like, I mean, this, this is all like very well known. But you know, uh, over the last two generations, the bottom fifty percent, seventy five percent of American society has been exposed to ever more economic precarity and ill health and you know loneliness. Um, while only you know the top one percent or ten percent have really benefited from um, our economic policies. Um, what was it? oh that but but you know a, a state that um, can commit to targets is also showing people what a kind of mastery over one's environment is like, um, and I think yeah I mean we, we we have a politics that kind of models on a large scale our own individual dysfunction right mm -hmm. where politics is mostly about expressing really loudly um, our values or opinions, um, but not saying like, I would like us to be able to work together for these three purposes by the end of the decade, right? Like I, this is what I want to accomplish. Um, and so I think it increasingly falls on individual people to become um, like hyper planners of their own lives, right? Where people mm -hmm. have all sorts of like crazy spreadsheets and, you know, this is how people approach the dating market and, um, you know, people are trying to, with very limited resources, like perform a mastery over 
their their individual selves um, that is really impossible. Um, so right, a, a politics that makes politics possible would, through having like a, a state that's really committed to, um, not necessarily deglobalization, but but um, mastering global flows of labor, capital, um, and goods, um, both to making people's like everyday material and, and, and economic lives more regular and predictable, and in in showing them like what it's like to um, collectively put aside like the vigorous expression of preferences uh, in favor of you know clear long range goals. Um, I mean, one one of the you know I haven't really followed this like long termism, effective altruism stuff that like you know now is so much in the news because of FTX. But it <clears throat> part of what's frustrating about this is like it shouldn't be billionaires who articulate long term goals for our society, right? Right. Like, I mean, all of those people should be shot. I think like the you know the hundred richest people in America should just you know be killed and their their money taken from oh them. We're going to have to cut this out. Country. Is this going to be able to go on YouTube? So, Anyways, wait, but, do you really be, do you really believe that? Yeah, for sure. Like it should it's it's a scandal that someone has you know fifty billion dollars or whatever. But but um, so you it, are a Marxist. You are just le- yeah. Don't, you don't have to be. You don't have to be. There's all sorts of positions from which we could um, endorse. For which, for which rounding up and murdering the wealthy is okay. Carry yeah. on. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it's uh, their children people. too, like wives and children too, or just. Um... I, Elon has to go. I would let Grimes and the other ones. You know, they 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 can be on their own journeys. Um, uh, <laughs> where was this going? Um, uh, uh, but like the the desire that someone should be articulating like long-term goals, like, yes, we should be like exploring space and like, yes, you know, we should, you know, have safeguards against artificial intelligence and, and it should be someone we collectively elected who, you know, has this project that like we can decide on. Um, I mean, I think, right. The, the disalignment of like the political process and long-term goal setting is really contributing to to our psychic dysfunction, um, yeah. and so you know I'm the we'll see whether the I don't know that the blueprint is going to solve anything, um, but but Michael also has a, a piece from a few months ago in American Affairs called uh, uh, "Ending the Culture Wars," in which he argues is a kind of uh, setup to our manifesto that uh, you know if we want to get out of the current political impasse where both sides really seem to be invested in like noisily expressing lifestyle preferences. Um, we have to figure out a way to build political coalitions that are really squarely expressed to people's material interest that can be like tracked over like a near midterm future. Um, okay. So, um, I have so much to say. So um, I don't even know where to start. Okay, I think maybe the best place to start is to is um, to describe a little bit like the way in which I see um, w- what a lot of people are doing in Doomer Optimism as basically a version of this project. Um, I totally agree. I love what you said about um, basically like celebrity politicians, like AOC is my girl, and and um, and then or Trump is my guy, um, and then they get elected and they don't reach any of the goals that they campaigned on, and nobody really cares because they're like like they're they're their patron basically. And I first saw this with Obama. A lot of my peers were like Obama um yeah right, oh, they, right. they, i mean he people, was, people don't like that part but that's really that's the a lot of my peers yeah. worked for obama i graduated from university of chicago in 2007 a lot of them went mm, straight to mm-hmm. working for him and ended up in the white house and then once he like once tarp happened and the whole bailout happened i was like super critical and people were like basically you can't be critical um so there was like no connect connection between what he campaigned on and or like the ability to critique that um what I would argue, though, as a counterpoint, or maybe it's just a both and situation, is I think that a lot of people are 
are almost out of practice in even thinking about um, what would be good material interest for them, what would be a goal they would actually want, um, which is why people are just fanboying like Elon's, you know, and various like moonshot because they they can't even think what they want, I think, on a material level. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I think maybe this is part of where the local is really important because I, I think about things like um, faculty governance at universities, which is like now almost totally eroded. Um, decisions are all in the hands of administration. Um, college presidents are now like, like very few of them come from within the university and they're more just like, you know, CEOs who move from institution to institution. Um, people don't belong to unions. People don't belong to, you know, religious organizations or like the Rotary Club or something. And so like, if you're not used to even like figuring out common material interest with people in a practical way, then it, it's like, hard you, to subscribe. Built... It, it's hard to subscribe to a goal-oriented politics then if you don't have that like frame of reference even. And so, so I would argue that you do need like a both and strategy. And most of what um, interests most of us is doing some sort of um, like restrengthening that muscle um, of working I interdependently, um, even on the tiniest scale of like friends are getting together and they're having like a clothing swap for their kids, you know, this kind of thing where you're like, you know, what, what do we all want? How, how do we get it? How do we negotiate these things? Um, and it helps you just think interdependently, like what we were talking earlier, like your identity as something related to somebody else. Um, but um, I think the other thing where I, I probably strongly disagree with the vision is just that a lot of us are like historical materialists and just see a contraction of the global economy coming um, necessarily. And so like a barbell strategy of, um, you know, small scale production, like maybe we're not going to feed ourselves totally, but, you know, even the, the act of um, learning how to keep chickens for me and for my kids has been like a, like a deeply um, humbling act that is sort of teaching me how to be um, productive in a way that's totally different than my email job productive type stuff. Um, and the, I guess the question comes, we have this debate constantly in Doomer Optimism, and a lot of times it's couched in this very nerdy Hobbit Lord of the Rings rhetoric about the Hobbit and the Shire, which I hate. Oh. It's so dorky. I know. I know. I veto. Um, I veto I know, that I know. Uh, discussion. But, I know. Today. But I'm just gonna like say like basically the idea is you know like you can't be the Hobbit staying in your Shire like they're gonna come for you, um, and and I think there is something really important to that and we struggle a lot with that. So I wonder if there is like a both and strategy where, on the local level, we sort of force ourselves to like stretch this muscle, civic engagement, um, the ability to be interdependent, um, the understanding of like what meaning comes from the actual act of creation like for me it's parenting and small scale tiny amount of food production i mean literally just fruit trees and chickens and then the the opposite end of the spectrum is then maybe a politics like you described that is like goal oriented um yeah, I wanna... and, and i mean could, hopefully... could i um just just what i see here where i live in um my little city in northwest washington is that we there's all kinds of things going on that I suppose I mean I I didn't I wouldn't put it in the way of material interest I guess I'm I I don't find the, the the sort of loosely Marxist framing of all this stuff useful at all mostly because in it there's a kind of um it's it's all oppositional um and I think that I think and, and I, I don't find that useful but um uh there's an organization close to me that its sole purpose is to teach people how to grow food. Um, so they do a lot of different things. Um, they have a community garden where once a month people come work on the garden and they make a big food from food from the, uh, make a big meal from food from the garden. They have a cider press. So lots of people and I live in a valley that used to be orchards, I believe. And it's just very easy to grow fruit here. So you can bring your apples and press cider. Um, or if you have more apples than you know what to do with, you let them know and you can organize people to come out and pick apples from your apple tree, which is what we all do with our neighbor's trees anyway. Um, 
And, you know, probably, I don't know of most, but a good chunk of my neighbors have vegetable gardens. Lots of people in my neighborhood have chickens. Um, I think it's been that way for a while. I don't know if it, it's not p political exact. It's not political at all, I don't think. Um, and uh, my wife's involved in something called the Buy Nothing Group, which I don't know if this, I assume this exists in other cities. Where every time it gets to more than a thousand people, it contracts to a more local place. And the idea is that you can't sell or trade anything. It's just like, hey, I need such and such. I'm giving away such and such. Yep. And it's kind of fun because there's always just strange people on my porch taking things that we're giving away. Or I get sent on missions to strange You can have people taking, taking things, things from your porch in Chicago, too. You know, it's, yeah. it's not called a <laughs> buy right, nothing. Like... But... <laughs> yeah. No, but they do have yeah, that Amazon, in the neighborhood. I, packages that... Yeah, but they do have that in the neighborhood I grew up in. My sister's in this, um, this I think it's called Freebox, where it's just a Facebook group. Okay. And people are like, yeah, I'm looking for a baby toy or something like that. And, and we get them. really good stuff. It's not just giving away junk. Like, it's a lot of... Um, uh and especially as parents i mean it's just so helpful because your kids grow out of things and trade them anyway all of this kind of thing is going on um and i think one of the reasons it works is that it's not framed as an oppositional politics at all mm -hmm. that p every p everyone can get involved in it regardless of what the, i have no idea what what anyone thinks um there's a tendency i find with organizations that become basically either like left-wing or right-wing catch-alls whatever the organization started as it sort of just migrates so suddenly it's like grow local food and free palestine and <laughs> you know a hundred other whatever things and then suddenly it's the same dozen like political people who are in every single political group in town um and it just seems like a complete dead end to me versus at least the appeal to do of doomer optimism to me anyway is twofold one is actually i think sort of pre-political or, or apolitical in some way there's no doom or optimism attempt at a mass political movement or a platform or something it, uh or a political party it's just not it's not framed at that level at all and the second is the scale in which it sees things which is not national or much less international it's, it's a much smaller scale um and uh and Blake, it seems like in what you're proposing, um, which I don't know, it sounds basically like Pat Buchanan minus the culture war rhetoric of a kind of well, we could, we could say Ross industrial well. policy and so on. Uh, and I don't mean that like pejoratively. That's just how it, yeah. what it is. So, right. I, mean, I, I, like. I would say, you know, not not uh, Buchanan, but the, the maligned Perot. Yeah. Yeah. Or sure. Ross Perot. Yeah. That it's sort of um, a a a. a fairly popular but never realized american political vision uh or hasn't been realized in a, in a long time it's it's what american industrial policy once was on some level um uh but the doomer optimism doesn't think on that scale and i think for me anyway that like the thinking on that scale is just simply not possible anymore that there's levels of complexity where epistemologically the you just can't and then and then even in doing so you risk going insane so um you know i'm i'm coming at this really through a, a critique of uh, foucault <laughs> um and you know part of the the manifesto is is dealing specifically with you know the following issue that um i am really sympathetic to and have written you know kind of favorably favorably about in recent years uh, Foucault's critique of uh, Marxism and uh, you know the liberal state, and <clears throat> I find in a variety of ways appealing. Like in in the late seventies and early eighties, he elaborates this kind of micro politics or lifestyle politics, where he says you know um, big collective assertions of you know, will, um, like something like a a capital R revolution are not possible or desirable. Um, so he's really like saying like the end of the revolutionary left um, and, you know, saying like, we've seen the totalitarian potential for these projects. Um, you know, he had been excited about the Iranian revolution. And then, and then after that, he's like, you know, I, I don't think Marxism or religion are resources for us doing a big 
collective political project. And I don't think we should want such a thing. It, it, it has to be like small, contingent, local. Um, and he's all about elaborating these, uh, you know, forms of life, right? So he has, he has a really great essay, uh, Friendship as a Way of Life, about, um, you know, male homosexuality in, in, in the late 70s and thinking about the possibilities of alternative forms of relation um, that don't have to be recognized by the state, that don't have to, you know, make sense to other people. Um, and I think, I mean, one, one of the things that I was interested about in the last couple of years is the way that uh, on the right, a lot of people became, in response to COVID, conscious or unconscious Foucauldians, right? Saying, like, yes, just as the bathhouses were spreading AIDS, like our churches and synagogues are spreading COVID, but, you know, the state needs to let us, like, experiment with forms of life and, you know, keep doing, like, our own thing. I think, I think there's uh, a lot of value to that, but that kind of thinking and its uptake by the academy is also responsible for the hegemony of neoliberalism, which has just gutted society over the last 40 years, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I don't want to defend uh, the USSR or old school communist parties, um, which is you know, part of what Foucault was critiquing, or the Iranian revolution. But if we give up on the very possibility of collective assertions of popular will, um, whether they're spontaneous or organized by parties and vanguards, you know, if if the, the small scale stuff, uh, I would say, like, I mean, that's what life is, right? Like life is having your friendships and, and, and communities, um, but that can't protect itself, right? I, I think um, we really need, th this is part of what I find appealing about the Straussian tradition, right? Is that there's a there's a sense of there being an ironic relationship between what's what's the good of private life, which for them is like philosophy and you know being like a gay Jewish atheist weirdo, um, and then the good of public life, which might be like pretending to be a patriotic goyish American Christian whatever, um, but that those are those are different, um, and I think yeah we need for me like a strong bureaucratic neutral state that can guide the economy. Um, so that, you know, people can have um, an apolitical, quirky, weird, um, you know, I mean, I, I went to like a hippie liberal arts college in Arkansas that had like a 90% acceptance rate. And I, I basically want life to be like that forever. <laughs> like I want people to <laughs> sit out in the grass and, you know, like have done the reading, but maybe not everyone that closely and, you know, um, <laughs> like to be uncompetitive and thoughtful and fun and, and listening to stuff, John Stevens. And, you know, like that, that's what I want life to be. Um, in order for that to be possible and for everyone to have like their own version of the liberal arts college, um, there has to be a really powerful institution that stands between us. And I mean, whether we think the problem is something like just the precarity and fluctuation of the global economy or, you know, uh, climate change or, you know, connected to that, like future economic collapse. Um, there, there has to be some very different kind of big thing. And, and I think the, the real challenge for, for making politics possible, making the right kind of politics possible is how do we get people to see the difference between what personal life should be like, where, I am like freely expressing my preferences and connecting with the people that I like. Um, and then what like collective, like what collective action is like, where uh, I'm not saying like me and my uniqueness or me as a blank, I'm saying like, I have this material interest, you have this material interest. Um, I mean, maybe, yeah, part, I really like this idea of building muscle, right? That like, um, and hopefully there can be a kind of feedback where like the right kind of political action helps us have like a good private life. You know, like it's it's easier to have a good community if I don't have to move cities every few years because there yeah. are no jobs. Yeah. Um, or there's just like chaotic amounts of crime or something. Right. Right. Like it's easier for me to like, <laughs> you know, uh, go to church or go out on a Saturday night if I'm not afraid of being mugged. Um, and on the other hand, yeah, like that the, the, these personal encounters, I mean, on, on the one hand, like that that's what is like the chief joy in life, 
but also that they're building real skills. Um, I mean, no one should ever go to church for this reason, but, but I started going to church like um, a year ago um, after like having like grown up evangelical. And one thing that I've forgotten about is like, oh, at church you have to like pretend to be nice to people who like you really cannot stand. <laughs> and you have to just like let old people who like you don't know, like talk like like there are some like old guys at church who like I have only been there a year and I've already heard like their stories like 10 times. Good. And yeah, and, and then like, you know, like I would never go for this reason, right? <laughs> like this is this is not what would put my ass in the pew, but it's it's good to like yeah remember that I have that ability um because that's something that translates into all sorts of other domains in life um and that yeah I mean these are places where we can practice remembering what like the oh but right we're here to do church so even though I find you kind of annoying I don't need to express that like that's not what I need to stage right now or like oh you know you have bad politics but like we're here to do like the food drive so like let's think about that and hopefully right. we can then translate that into politics where, I mean, it, it sounds really weird for me to say this because I think he's like a total turd and nut job, but Sora Bamari lately has written a couple of things where he's like, oh, you know, even adjuncts and like blue haired genderqueer Starbucks workers deserve like a living wage and should have health care, um, even though like I think they're going to hell or, or whatever. Um, and right, like that's what politics is, you know, politics is like, you know, I, I would like there to be like a minimally decent world for everyone. And I would like them to be able to like pursue their life projects, even if I find those projects like really strange. Um, yeah, so I, I, I really like the idea that like the, it's not just that the local is a retreat from, because I think, I think often like in the, in the intellectual theorization of, um, this turn to lifestyle politics in like the late 70s, 80s, 90s. It was like, we can't have grand narratives. History is over. We can't do, we can't do big politics anymore. Let's just pursue the self, um, which has contributed to, you know, so many of our problems. But this idea that the local is um, an opportunity to build the skills that we need to do the big political stuff, which exists in order to enable the local. I mean, you know, wh where one should start in like this kind of uh, hopefully virtuous circle, I, I guess it's just, you know, a, a sort of personal question, like where one is best able to do something. Uh, but yeah, I, I really like the, this is like a building a certain like psychic capacity to, um, you know, bear with other people to remember what's really important in this situation. And also like, I would just argue, um, so I'm from Chicago. Um, I I've never like lived rural before I'm moving to Uruguay. I'm on nine acres. And um, what I've learned from interacting with a landscape, I think is informative in that um, there are, for example, um, some insights that come from interacting with the landscape that I wouldn't have had if I tried to design it in advance. So like there are this invasive bamboo growing behind this building and we I removed it because I just thought it's, it's growing underneath the building. And I thought like, we just have to put something down to stop that bamboo from growing there. But once it was removed, I was like, wow, this is a lovely space for a patio. And so we've made a little nice patio there on the side of the building and one side there's the bamboo and it's a really beautiful little space and and i think this is also true with like uh social experiences where it's only once you've had exercised the muscle and like um experimented with something that you see then like the potential that opens up whereas i think a lot of politics are like you know either a politics of perfection or like a design type politics where you think i just will i i have this brilliant idea in my head it's totally going to work and i just design it all in advance as opposed to like this iterative experimental um you know sort sort of flexing these muscles of of like interacting with the world poking at the c complex system and seeing how it responds and i think it just goes back to like what we were talking about earlier where people think politics is like forcing somebody to answer the question, what is your pronoun? And they don't even know what the question means as opposed to trying to meet the person where they're at, explain what their perspective about gender pronouns is without alienating the guy and having a conversation about that. Um, and so I, the way I 
my so sort of theory of change is like this, um, maybe not scaling up necessarily, but scaling out of these kind of experiments that can then sort of, it, this is the whole reason my my field school is named Rhizoma Field School, a rhizomatic structure of, uh, and the the bamboo is actually rhizomatic and it's ha horrible to try to- and Yeah, and that, that you have to remove. So. This way. <laughs> um, and it's so funny that I just brought that up, but um, but I also think that- Kudzu. The, what'd you say? Said kudzu. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was also um, rhizomatic and horrible. Yes, and it's and it's very hard to eradicate once you like have those connections and are really sort of strong and um, I guess see each other as a part of something similar that you want to protect, something you care about, and you only kind of figure out what you care about by like flexing the muscle of figuring out what brings you meaning in life kind of thing and, and the kind of people you have loyalty to from figuring that out together. Um, but the other thing is, I do still think you just need a baseline, like not homeless people everywhere, you know, access to health care, like, you know, you can get by. So I think that that there's got to be a both and strategy. It's just really hard for me to even think about. I, I think like I'm agree, I agree with Donald, like I just feel like there's just it's just really hard to make that happen, although I, I'm in favor of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so a couple I think... thoughts, if I could. Yeah. Um one the Yvonne Illich would be in my head of like what what do we mean by healthcare? You know? Um it, uh I, I think you open up cans of worms, like you can't have some things just a little bit. You know, does that mean building more hospitals? Right. Or you know, the the does that mean just expanding anyway? I think I think that it's interesting I mean, we, with we, some we of these things. Have, like we, we have a real shortage of hospital beds. Like so I, I would say Well, sure. And maybe you yes. think we need more people in hospitals. But anyway, there's um uh we're talking about these things in a real abstract way. Mm -hmm. um, but I, like, even like, oh, yes, the baseline is you can't have lots of criminals and homeless people. Well, what follows from that? Um, moving more people into jail or prison, for example. Anyway, there's, you know, the, the uh, it's like one thing to say these things abstractly and another thing to actually like what follows from them. And I'm not sure what follows is a kind of neutral um beneficent yeah bureaucratic state that sets a nice uh labor policy and then gets out of the way so everyone can like have Flourish. a bucolic time well, like right. reading I mean, books in the grass like anyway currently I, there are not enough people in prison i mean you know i i'm i'm i may be you know just a bit of a neocon here but like um you know, I mean, in 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 Hyde Park. Okay, uh, sure, fair enough. Anyway, I uh, um uh anyway, I, I just don't. Yeah, it's easy to talk about this stuff abstractly, and I think it gets a lot more complicated. Um, and I, maybe when you when we read your manifesto, I mean, it will it won't be abstract. It'll be extremely. Um, I mean, uh, I, I I I won't say you know how how many hospital beds, how many people in prison. <laughs> the more five year plan. I, I I'm in favor of more of both so far. So something that comes to mind, I think maybe this is a Lashian idea. Certainly, it's an Illichian idea. Is um, the the need to separate spheres of life to to put a to put a line between public and private life uh, to not talk about, not argue about politics at the church potluck, to not argue about politics when you're. Um, helping your neighbor with yard work or something that to to not bring that into your own home and that paradoxically this makes public life possible like the mm -hmm. creeping of public life into private life where there isn't really private life anymore and i've been thinking lately how some of this is technological that like it used to use the spheres of life used to be literally physically separate like you'd have to walk into town to go to the market to buy things and then you'd go to the pub to argue with your friends and then you'd come home but you couldn't shop from home that that caught that you might produce things in the home there was a home economy certainly but like buying things as, existed in a separate place and um arguing about things existed in a separate place and now there there is no um separation at all because the technologically we've transcended those physical barriers and so I think there's a need to be intentional, like very intentional about refusing 
um refusing to do or have certain conversations to do certain things in some places and i think that yeah. that's a refusal that's accessible to anyone right away we don't have to wait for a mass movement or we don't have to wait for something to change in industrial policy we can we can make those refusals and i think refusing science too in that way that like no actually i don't want to hear or know about what the scientific study about raising children says i don't want to allow those parts of private life to be open to research and investigation and i think that that um that separation of public and private uh regardless of what the large is happening on the large scale it is possible to practice on the private on the small scale and in fact is what most people do. Most people don't argue about politics on the internet, for example. Um, they just don't. Uh, it's there's some a, a certain type of college educated, whatever person is very focused on on completely erasing that distinction. Um, anyway, um, but so I mean, I, I certainly think right. I I, I don't want to. Like it, it, it's hard to know what are the real possibilities for individual agency, like in regard to any psychological thing. And it's probably better to falsely believe you have too much rather than not enough, because then you know you might like stretch yourself and like do more than you think you can. I mean, that's what they always tell depressed people, right? That you should like do more today than than you think that you can. Um, but I do think you know, like I, I lived in in Europe for several years during my PhD and there's a lot more of a separation between people's private and work life, for instance. Um, or to think, you know, like uh, like my partner in France was not really out at work, but people, Gesundheit actually didn't, didn't like, um, didn't really talk necessarily to colleagues about like their, uh, you know, dating life or their politics. Um, in part, like no one could be fired. I mean, it was extremely difficult to fire people. Um, so I think that also meant that there was less of a, you, you see in the U.S. like people using their persona as a means of economic competition. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it's to some extent rational for people to, you know, uh, have their, have their LinkedIn connected to their personal Twitter where they're expressing political opinions you know, have their Instagram on their Grinder account, you know, like have everything like all linked together um, in a way that like to people in other countries seems like, you know, really insane. Um, but like a, a, a friend of mine from Mexico said uh, a few years ago, and this really stuck with me, that everything in America feels like a pageant. Mm. That you're always like, as Miss South Carolina, like I blah, 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 you know, like you and, and you need to do this in every venue like it, it's not enough that like um the romantic thing be romantic or that the work thing be the work thing but like that that all of you needs to be transportable um in part because that can give you a certain kind of leverage in these competitions um or that i could say like if i get screwed over that like oh like you know you didn't hire me because blah 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 mm -hmm. um or that I'm looking out for you to like say the wrong thing on your personal Twitter so that I can get you fired and then like move up in my job. Um, and I think, I think politics like has a, like a healthy politics would have a role in setting barriers and making it, I mean, we, you know, in many States people can be fired at will, um, you know, being fired for many people is like a death sentence. Like you, you know, you, you want, I mean, we, we can say whether or not healthcare is something that like, is desirable in its current state, but like I mean, you know, I like I I know people whose ability to live like depends on them having the employment that they do, um, and 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 like you know, in in the, in the past few years, like I wouldn't have done the kind of writing or probably even thinking that I was able to do, um, except from being like I, I had a four-year well-paid union job, so I could save up money, and I knew that it would be complicated to fire me if someone really didn't like something that I did. Um, and that's political stuff. I mean, yeah. you know, that that the supposedly like pro-worker right, for instance, doesn't do anything about like protecting, like you want to protect free speech, like, you know, make sure that people can't be fired easily. 
like it you know it's and and that also like allows people to for instance like you know almost all of my colleagues in in office jobs like at, at academic institutions or museums or ngos 2020 2021 were made to do often really um humiliating and intense uh dei race stuff like things that went on like on like you know like every week hour-long meetings for months um where you're supposed to talk about like what are in theory really intimate parts of yourself like your experiences of oppression and how you know how you feel about politics and um and if you don't you're punished um like you know you, you don't have any ability to say no um and so it makes sense that a lot of people have a kind of Stockholm syndrome where they're constantly performing like what good political subjects they are in their private life um, because they know that like they they will lose out on economic and social and romantic opportunities if they don't. Um, and I mean, they, they have the slice some... of life for which that's true is very narrow. I mean, I it's right. It's very it's, it's, narrow. It's, Right. It, I mean, I, I do not know a representative set of people. I mean, you know, there's uh, sure. But yeah. but I mean, I mean there's I'm certain also... professions, I think there's certain professions for which that's absolutely true. But I think the number of people in them is actually really tiny and that basically it's like vying to be a member. You're vying to be a member of the ruling party in some way. Like, I mean, uh, I, I don't know that people making fifty thousand dollars at an NGO or in the, you know. The, well, that's what's fascinating is it's not about how much money you make. Like, uh, the the uh, can have like anyway. Uh, but but in, don't in the you same think... way that being like a party member doesn't mean that you're really in charge. It's just that you anyway you're 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 part of a, a you're part of something even if it, you're not actually very well paid. And of course, it's party members who are the most at risk of of um, liquidation. Well, I would just push back and say I do think like the younger generations in increasingly are like just captured by this whole ecosystem of like having having to be online and be legible in some all these various networks. And then that does if they have any sort of like um you know, email type job, white collar job, it it's a part of their whole experience. My pushback would be, um, it just seems to me that right now, it's pot, there are strategies to resist that that are like cultural in nature, you know, and, um, you know, just sort of forcing yourself to not be legible in certain ways, like refusing to participate, of course, you can't like completely opt out. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I just think like just trying not to subject yeah. yourself to I mean, certain aspects of it and then building up that cultural muscle where we're like, this is no, we don't we don't do this in our culture. Almost like I don't know if Donald, you agree, but like at the family level too, a lot of us think about, you yeah. know, exposing our kids to these kinds of things and, and talking to them about it and getting them like prepared to just sort of resist a lifetime of this potentially. But also not to be oppositional because there's a kind of anti PC anti-identity politics persona that is itself its own trap yes. that yes. people fall into and it has its own uh rules and is in, in its own caricature that i think is really destructive and i think the nice thing about stuff like growing food having children um going to even church, being like involved in civic organizations lifting weights going is that no matter how much Im how many images are put on top of it to mediate it at the end of the day, there's something um, irreducibly real, like your plants are either going to grow or not. <laughs> your children need to be fed. You're either going to lift the barbell off the ground or not. <laughs> and um, there's no amount of uh, ideological or marketing stuff you can put on top of that that changes on some level that physical thing. Now, Blake, you please yeah, disabuse yeah. me. So, I mean, I sort, sort of the... On the one hand, like I, 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 I really, I, I, I like the yeah, like the the building muscle analogy, and and I really like the thought that like, um, you know that that doing this on the small scale should enable us to do this on the large scale, which should then enable us to do it even more thoroughly on the small scale, and because we don't know like what are the possibilities even within our own individual life, right? 
Um, like we we don't know until we test them. Um, and so I, I would would never want to say like I think I think it's a really I think it's equally toxic to say there are no individual solutions. We have to wait for the collective thing. Um, and to say like there can only be like individual like I ha I can only get my lifestyle right and then like not be concerned about you know what in our politics is making it easier or harder to live the kind of life I want. Um, but I think you know. There, there's this way where recently the right has been kind of discovering or taking up things that the left did in the 60s, 70s. And I think people thought like in the left in the 60s, 70s, that there's no way that rolling around in the mud and fucking can be taken up by capitalism and the state and the man. Like this is the most like anti the man thing. Um, but it turns out that's not true, right? It turns out that like um, uh, the... Like American society underwent a transformation in values since the 60s and 70s, but not of power structures, right? I mean, the you know, um, it's still the same giant companies and military industrial complex, and you know, but now they're they're in favor of you know, I don't know, polyamory and uh, you know, whatever. Um, so the the uh, the thought that there is a particular lifestyle or a particular kind of act that can be so real and raw and threatening to the establishment that there's no way that it can be co-opted or, or totally mediated. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think this is something that like. Um, but why make it try to make it something that's a threat to the establishment? I guess that's what I'm saying. It's that by the very act of trying to frame what you're doing as a as a political threat that that actually is the channel by which it becomes integrated um, and and destroyed. I mean, so for the new, the failures of the new left and back to the land in the 60s and 70s, it's an interesting question in history that hasn't been fully told. But to me, what's interesting is, well, what were the actual experiences of people who really tried to do back to the land and kept doing it? I've met some of those people. Now, for them, the fact that the new left was a political failure doesn't matter on some level because the life they were able to create was interesting. Now, a lot of the back to the land stuff was really destructive. I mean, uh, having met people who grew up in those kind of communal hippie things, and there's a lot of sexual abuse of children, which doesn't get talked about, that the, the, the breakdown of, of, uh, the nuclear family, which now gets vaunted even by um, whatever his name is, the New York Times, the, the conservative op-ed writer is, you know, critiquing the nuclear family. Well, if if parents aren't the ones watching children, it turns out it exposes children to all sorts of dangers that are much worse than the supposed repression of the nuclear family. So uh, some, I think some of the assumptions in the, the left-wing back to land movement were just wrong headed and actually destructive. But for people who didn't do the drugged out, you know, I think that that actually just, you know, small scale agriculture and just made that their lives. I mean, that to me is interesting. Well, and uh, I that there are ways in which sorry, go ahead. Uh and I think that as the people who made it work were probably the ones who dropped all the stuff about taking it uh, sticking it to the man and so on well I, and I, actually just focus on the more concrete things of how can i raise animals or how can i get enough crop yield from my 20 acres to do such and such how can i work with my neighbors who know a lot about fixing tractors and those became the sort of central things of life and that the people I think who and then those ab ideological abstractions faded away because there's something like when you're attempting to grow food on a small scale, the ideological stuff starts to recede because then it's like, oh, why are my tomatoes not growing properly? <laughs> what do I need to do to get more potatoes out of this limited raised bed? Oh, this variety of potatoes work better than others. Even in my own experience in vegetable gardening, those are the things you start to think about. Um, or, you know, hey, my neighbor's tomatoes are doing great. I'm going to go ask, you know, and then you're not even thinking about sticking it to the man. The issue is like building, uh, building a life.
Yeah. Well, I would just add, like, I think I, this is um, something I think we've danced around on Doomer Optimism, but never said explicitly. So I'm so glad we had this conversation because it really solidified this difference in approach, your psychological approach to the actions. Is it because you think you are doing, and Neil Clark says this, oil towel, he says this, do, are you doing it because you think you're saving the world? If you are, it changes the thing itself. Like, are you doing it for Cottagecore? Are you doing it for Instagram? And I think there's probably a Lashian um, critique here too, which is like, you know, are you doing it as like a narcissistic performance of a thing? Or are you doing it because you're interested in the thing itself and like willing to be humbled by it? I bet there's, that, yeah. there's a huge distinction and there, I think. And in the ability to recognize that and hold on to it. I mean, so, so, I mean, Donald, your suggestion initially was like that there's something about the activity of like having kids, you know, uh, working the land that like in, in its realness intrinsically resists co-optation or mediatization. Um, I think that's right. If you are to persist in it, at some point you have to actually do the thing. And I, you know, I, I, I do neither of these things. Um, so, you know, perhaps I just, uh, uh, but one, I mean, I, I, I like, you know, have family in Mississippi who are, you know, doing versions of the things who don't seem particularly more plugged into reality. Um, and I think, you know, something that, that I certainly have seen over the past years with like, uh, you know, gay people and, and, you know, other kinds of people who like, might have been thinking that there's a there's a core to what they're doing that in its like bodily reality or in its like you know uh, uh, in its materiality resists co-optation you know I mean I, I think you know when I was like uh, like figuring myself out in my teens like in in like a you know uh, a really like hostile evangelical environment it felt like well I have now like latched onto something that's so like individual and like bodily and like concrete and then there's all of this like uh oppressive abstract like fake stuff that's around me um so at least like if i hold on to this like i maybe don't know what to do with it i don't know how to think about it i don't know what's i don't know like what's right for like a worldview but i know that like this i'm gonna like you know use to think with but you know i i think like part of especially like in, a, in an age of like social media, um, it's really hard to think of something that can't somehow resist being turned into like it, it's virtual mm. opposite. Um, and especially, right, um, I mean, thinking about like lifting weights, you know, so I, I, I just, we, we don't have to talk about that, but I did just write this thing where I was like, um, you know, the the way that, like a project of masculinization, like I'm gonna I'm gonna resist like a feminized society by posting selfies of myself at the gym. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna show everyone how hot I am, and that will own women. Like you know, like I I I will resist women by becoming the worst kind of like insta thought. You know, um, and and a lot of these guys like can you know in terms of their their online brand are basically like. Are basically doing a version of OnlyFans, you know, like they have like their um, their you know subscriber content, and um, you know they there there is a way where like whatever way that you're living your life, like really online, you become a kind of like OnlyFans person, right? Because you've like monetized your your self image, um, and I think yeah, actually, like I, I, I Someone I want to I want to think more about with like narcissism is um, Beauvoir. So like in she has a chapter on narcissism in the Second Sex, where she like is a really great critic of narcissism. She describes it like in in ways that really resemble what Lash says, and she thinks that it's a problem that women have because of patriarchal society. And once women can enter the workforce and enter contact with like real things outside of like performative femininity, then we'll all be free of narcissism. And the the gap between her like beautiful description of how narcissism works like in a person and then her totally wrong vision of the future is like something i really want to explain but she has this great analysis of like um like so her sister was like trying to be a painter but like you know it's like a terrible amateur painter and a housewife and before in her letters is always making fun of her um and so she has this description of like a woman who is a painter 
but who never like gets good at it because she's always thinking about how she looks as a painter. So she makes sure when someone comes in the room, she's like, oh, I was just painting. Like, and, and it's precisely like, you know, if you know someone on Instagram who's always documenting their activity, where it's like, you don't really, like this person doesn't care about the thing they're doing. They care about being seen yep. doing the thing. Yeah. Um, and that's like such a real distinction from the outside but everything about our society invites us to forget it, like from the inside, to like be unable to say like, oh, this is really about the thing. Like I Yes. Like, well, okay, but my counter argument is, and I'm sorry, Donald, but we have to do it. Um I think that like the Baptist, for example, like oh. you you are not they're just not having a normal one. And you have to ask yourself is what you're doing something you can like explain to your grandmother? Do you have a machine in your home for tanning your balls? No, no, if we're we not going to talk okay, about this. If we do, if we no, but the, the just kind of this weird stuff where it goes into these extreme zones. And I think part of what the, our project is at Doomer Optimism is y you can both, you know, enjoy bodybuilding, uh, um, I think Mary Harrington says this all the time. She says, lift, but don't post physique. Like in, in every, in every like arena, do, you, you want to do this stuff, but you don't want to give yourself up to the machine and to be, to be molded by the machine. And so I think it, the idea here is like, it's okay to get some sun, but you have to, you know, <laughs> it's okay to tan. It's okay to get vitamin D. It's okay to go outside, but like, don't make it your personality. Don't, feed that part of yourself to the machine and there's like this resistance in that i think yeah so and, and like i can I think... see your physical excitement to respond but i'd like to give a word about lifting if i could mm -hmm. so the there's been a renaissance renaissance in barbell resistance training uh, over i don't know the time frame and it's been led primarily by a crossfit mm -hmm. and which you know, there are good things and bad things about CrossFit and then Mark Ripito and starting strength. And what's interesting about CrossFit and Mark Ripito is neither of them are weird about women. <laughs> uh, they're just not that women participate fully in both that women doing strength training is completely normal in both those environments. And and the third thing is that it's not about bodybuilding. Like bodybuilding is this really particular form of strength training that's very focused on muscle hypertrophy as more important than actual strength and it's all aesthetically focused i think bodybuilding is actually terrible it it's very aesthetically focused often associated with steroid use um is it destructive physically in many ways uh, a lot of bodybuilders um uh are killed by it because it um and, and so I think bodybuilding is, it, I think it's so horrible that these guys really push bodybuilding right. as the means to masculinity, because it's very, it's very strange, because it's it's not actually about developing physical strength. Uh, it's just it's bodybuilding. It, the goal is in is 100% image based and always has been. It's about right. pageants, like bodybuilding comp competitions are an obscure form of beauty pageant. So, um, I actual, like if you, Mark Ripito is interesting if you read him, because it, for him, strength training is yes, about getting physically strong, but it's also an, an existential project about, um, about training, about training yourself to, uh, overcome diff, to, to complete difficult tasks and that this has a transformational thing psychologically and Ripito's politics I and mean, he's basically a, he's a libertarian not basically he is a libertarian I'm not very interested in libertarianism um but anyway that's my defense that like the, the the renaissance in in barbell training which is a very efficient and fun way I think to get physically strong like if you're doing these traditional lifts which have come back into prominence the the deadlifts and overhead press and squats you will get strong uh and it's not about 
image it's not image based actually um and i would just in the way that in the way that bodybuilding is so that's my defense of uh and and i yeah and i would just bring it back to interdependence like is what you're doing this like in group signal about yourself and lifting yourself up um so that you look a certain way and can be photographed and seen as some individual um reaching some goal to this in group that's specific to this like like little weird subculture or are you engaged in something that um makes sense in an interdependent context and doesn't just like force your culture onto others you know and it also just helps your life for example like back pain all these things which uh like if we sit a lot of the day like a lot of modern life is very sedentary and then we develop all these aches and pains in our back and our knees that we just have come to accept as normal mm -hmm. and part of life it turns out that they aren't and you don't have to accept them that you can overcome a lot of injuries and frailty and pain through getting stronger um like my wife has had a great experience do with barbell training and like oh these various things it turns out i can just feel better and same like back pain used to be a thing for me it's just not so anyway that's my pitch to everyone do you don't have to be a ridiculous image fo focused bodybuilder there's that you can get stronger and it's a cool experience to lift 300 pounds off the floor for the first time and it's hard and you get to uh you know and hopefully do it with friends um and uh, uh encourage each other and like uh strength training environments that are actually focused on getting strong in my experience are some of the most sort of communally encouraging and non-judgmental and not caring about looks places that exist where total strangers will will cheer you on and encourage you and people you know regardless who you are can uh find that so that's uh versus the bodybuilding thing again it's just completely image-based and i think uh destructive um i've never been inside of a gym so i i, I have i have no um but i mean some, something that's kind of come around yeah it's like you know all, all of these um uh, <clears throat> sort of life building activities like these these things that like are um essential to our personal visions of a good life <clears throat> or the kind of life we want to make for ourselves it seems like so many things about the world we live in invite us to misrecognize them as being either ways of saving the world as being like <clears throat> immediately unified with the political or as being, um, and this maybe isn't even an alternative, but as um, a kind of spectacle that we have to also disseminate out in the world as like, you know, contributing to our, our image. Um, it's very hard to let things, um, like to let our hobbies be hobbies, let our lifestyle be a lifestyle. Um, you know, there's a way where, right, like, I mean, gay guys got really into like bodybuilding in the 80s, like as a way of showing that they were like, still hot and strong in spite of AIDS. And, you know, it, it's sort of really like, you now like straight guys have been getting really into it the past few years and it's like coded as this conservative activity. Um, but the, like, how does one avoid turning the thing that gives one pleasure and connects one to other people in like a small scale way into a fantasy political project so that like politics can actually be sort of you know, emotionally calmer, rational, material interest stuff. Um, and it, it's weird. I mean, Ash, like, as you point out, like, we all, like, we can feel the difference. And especially we can see it in other people. Like, it's really easy to recognize, like, but, but, um, you know, like, I catch myself sometimes, like, reading something. And I'm like, oh, this is a really funny passage. I should post this. And then I have to think, like, no, I should, like, I should not post this. So I'm like, uh, uh, like, the... And I don't know, like how how we build this like muscle of bearing psychic tension. Um, I mean, I I, I would I, I'd be curious, like, what do you guys even think about? Yeah, how 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 do we do that? Like, some of it has to be like you know from within the individual building that muscle. Some of it has to be like you know helping people with with sort of collective problem solving. Um, I would like to say that it's about 
loneliness or, you know, isolation that like, I feel like, you know, if I can't tell my friend or my partner, or, you know, if I can't say like, look, what I, oh, I did this cool thing today. Like if I don't have someone to tell that to, but then some of the biggest posters, like, um, I, I, I shouldn't be mean. She did just get off Twitter, but like, um, Elizabeth Brunig and I would always be like, um, you know, posting about like what, like the disgusting casserole she made for dinner or like, you know, uh, and it's like, you have a great, like in theory, like a great family or like Jason Stanley, you know, who has like some, you know, fabulous tenure track job. Um, like you don't have to be on here. Like, you know, you have colleagues who like in principle take you seriously. You've got a wife, like, so it, it can't, like even people who have like good material circumstances are seduced by this wanting to turn like your own lifestyle into this like totalizing um, political thing. And, and this is sort of like what Lash says is the essence of narcissism, right? Like wanting to collapse like your self image into the world. Um, yeah, like I, I totally believe like these these things that give us pleasure and connect us to others, that's that's life. Um, and, you know, a good society is one where like, we can have different ones and it doesn't feel like a, a conflict of values. You know, it doesn't feel like, um, like, oh, I must like stop the the bodybuilders or, you know, I must uh, stop people who aren't working out. Um, yeah. Like what, what, what? Yeah. I have like my that. best experience of this. Yeah, or... You go, you go, I'll go. After okay. You. My best experience of this was at St. John's college where I studied, which, um, is one of the few places where faculty governance still means something it's still it's it's a conflict now though you can see that there's a much more so in the past there's attempts to wrest it away now um and so, and part of that is imposed by um the federal regulation of universities which forces them to take on certain bureaucratic roles but St. John's College is fascinating. People will come to St. John's, some people come to St. John's thinking, I'm going to read the great books to save the West mm -hmm. or to defend the West. And then, but you get that gets broken down on a variety of levels, part of which is because most people who say that don't actually read the books. And then when you actually read the books, they tend to turn out to be much more, much stranger and less obviously um programmatic or systemic and they also disagree with each other <laughs> and so it, it um that just being forced to in a group of people actually read the primary texts i found was extremely um liberating and cool because it turned out if you actually read the primary texts and not a kind of regurgitated vision of them then they're just what much stranger and more difficult and interesting than any um like political vision of them could be and that also the faculty at St. John's I had the privilege of studying with a lot of um faculty some of whom were now retired who'd been at the college for 30 40 years had been undergrads there in the 60s during the kind of golden age of the school and had just spent so much time with these texts and also so much time learning how to have conversations, to have the proper amount of detachment, not too much detachment. And uh, the culture of the place really um, doesn't encourage cleverness or using fancy words or uh, performance. You, you get everyone performs at first in seminar but it gets broken it it's it's subtly discouraged in a way that it just gets broken down until you eventually you build enough trust as a group that you find yourselves actually having a conversation or discussion mm -hmm. in a way that's very disarming and cool and not having an argument even if there are disagreements and that's one of the only times where i've where what happens in seminar really becomes this small thing where we we address each other differently we only use mr or miss and then last name and then as soon as seminar ends you can go out to the coffee shop and suddenly we're addressing each other by first name maybe people are arguing about politics and that's fine 
but that there's this wonderful separation, even in modes of address and manner of speaking that enables those conversations to happen in a way that's really beautiful. Um, so that would be my, the example that comes most to mind of an exa- of a place that's actually managed to, um, to do this. And yeah. it's, there are not explicit rules. It's not like you will not talk about politics and seminar or something like that. It might even come up, but there's just a culture of the place led by a mature faculty who who have who are able to to guide things in a certain way. Well, yeah. I mean, so I, I, I gave a talk at St. John's in <clears throat> just before COVID, um, like February 2020 at Santa Fe, and I was really impressed with the students. And I was talking to faculty after and I was like, oh, you know, how do you how do you arrange it so that they're all so like, you know, delightful? And they're like, oh, well we can tell the shitty ones to leave. Um, so, I mean, I, yes, I that do sophomore think... year at St. John's, they go through student by student and decide which ones are allowed to continue. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there is this way, you know, this is sort of circling back to like hard political choices, like who's going to be in prison? What are we, how are we going to hospitalize people? Like you do in fact have to have political authority that says we have a great, like squishy humanist liberal arts college. We love this thing. And to defend it, we absolutely will get rid of the people we have to get rid of. <laughs> yeah. Like, but in my cohort, we, we, no one was kicked out and we had difficult people, but we, I don't know, as long as it's, we worked with them and some, you sons, you become, they become lovable in a way because sometimes people are difficult because they're just so excited to talk yeah. that they talk yeah. too much and they talk over people but you work on them well okay so, so it, it's, i don't think they kick very many people out actually but but i'm i'm sure that the threat of it like does do something to you have to make it work mm-hmm. you're not just going to get to stick around here um like you know you you could get fired basically there's some sort of like yeah. p- potential there um my example i have a couple uh, thoughts on this the first person I want to bring up who looms large over this podcast and will not come on is Neil Clark Boyle Dowell. He makes everybody so mad. Um, he's a he's a just a carpenter, regular working class guy in Maine. And he get he makes these kids. He's not a regular guy. Well, he's like an artist. Let's be real. He's a carpenter, but there is nothing regular about him. Okay. Anyways, he but he's You know, I know another person who was a non-regular carpenter. Oh, <laughs> Um, but anyways, he's always making fun of these guys because they th- uh, the, a lot of the Baptists especially, but they think like th- their project is so political. And he's got this tweet he constantly just sends to people. It's It goes, you are not Mishima or Ulysses or Custer or anyone like that. You are a machine that turns lattes into urine and has panic attacks when video games aren't released when they said they would be. Um, I love that because you do just need like an older guy putting people in their place. Like you're not like you're being weird stop being weird uh this is not normal behavior you're not having a normal one um and then the other thing is i'm just thinking about your experience in church like you know in that case what the rules are you know you have to listen to the old people um and it's because there's this sense of mutual thriving um i do think what you were saying donald about like a sense of trust you do have to have like a baseline level of trust to be able to um, manage this kind of interdependence. And I also think um, in my dissertation research, at least people are growing their own food um, and and connecting with other people who are producing food in Chicago and a sense of like mutual thriving, like a mutual goal in mind. So I guess maybe in your seminars, Donald, I'm thinking about like, we want to get to the bottom of this. We want to understand these things like fundamentally. We don't want to just peacock. We want to really like understand these texts and the ideas and why they matter for our lives in church. It's like, we want to have a sacred space, um, with growing your own food. It's like, we want to be successful at this. So we're going to share information, like having some goal in mind. And I think that just really dovetails with your idea, Blake, about the politics, like goal oriented politics, as opposed to like celebrity persona, you know, politician oriented politics. I think it just really does come back to that, like a, a sense that we do have like some sort of mutual thriving um, at stake. So I want to yeah. think about politics as little as possible for my <laughs> own life. So, but here's my defense of what I think Blake is doing. Okay. Maybe like correct yeah, me let, if I'm let's, wrong. Ra- let's wrap up with this. Let's have Blake, <laughs> you do this and then, then let's you can it. give a, so that uh, to make politics, national politics, 
so dry and goal goal oriented that they don't elicit any personal passions and that no one could possibly mistake their personal hobbies and life for politics because like oh what is politics it's trade policy or whatever um stuff like that and that there's just become such a clear line between like oh what is politics it is trade policy and labor policy and putting more people in hospitals or whatever um and that all the other stuff is uh, so clearly demarcated um that i'll just leave the other things to you the trade policy and so on and um i'm fairly pessimistic about all those things but maybe you'll figure it out <laughs> and if so great i just won't worry about it and i'm going to do these other things so, and in that way, I can uh, accommodate your vision um, by being probably largely ignorant of it. Uh, but, and maybe, then but maybe flexing thing. the muscle on the, on the scale that's legible to you, like flexing the muscle that's needed for like civic participation and interdependence. And, I, I, sure, I and if you ever find possible. your way to my city, maybe you we have a mutual friend and Joseph Keegan and Joey and I can can get you under a barbell you know and it'll be awesome i, don't, I weigh 125 pounds you know, I, I oh that's I, you, that means you uh, get a you have a lot I, of i really i i have to say like great. i i love that straight guys are into this now but i i've had many like if had i wanted to do this you know i i have much subcultural exposure um but right i i think a a real kind of question that I mean, people could disagree about is like um uh, what kind of emotion is needed in public life to get the ball rolling on this i mean maybe this is just my own you know weird kind of sentimentality but i love that like we choose to go to the moon shit you know i i, I love like national grandeur um uh, i like the flag um the french do like these bastille day parades where they have like you know the jets flying over and like macron on the tank and i think i think that stuff is really cool um i mean i think the idea that we could have a, a purely rational public life that didn't have a lot of emotion of some kind in it. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, maybe that would be healthier, but I think, you know, it, people want to be on a team. Um, there's a certain amount of like longing for greatness that is essential to at least some people in, in humanity, right? Like, and this is. Oh, so maybe you know, I totally misunderstood your vision. Well, so I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't like waxed lyrical about you know our, our need for grandeur, um, which is something that BAP you know is is. So all you're about, so right? you're almost like an old fashioned nationalist then. Again, yeah. I don't mean this pejoratively, yeah. but uh, I mean, so, so, someone at a party once once said like, "Oh, Blake, you're a nationalist and a socialist. That's interesting." Um, but you know, yeah, um, but I, I think that's actually like a very normal thing in the last like hundred, hundred and fifty years yeah. that like. You know, you want a strong, competent state that takes care of people and is great. Like, indeed, like America should be great. That that shouldn't be like a threatening or racist or like you know particular kind of project, right? Like, and now now from like my final descent into insanity. Before we finish, someone who got this during um, the 2016 election was Marianne Williamson. Um, I, I really she had this line where she was like. You know, my first day as as president, I would call up the prime minister of New Zealand, Jacinda What's Her Face, and I would say, "You said you want your country to be the best for a child to grow up in. Well, America is going to be the best place for a child to grow up in. I think that's great. Like this this kind of um, you know competitive spirit, a desire for national greatness. Um, so you really I, are so similar to like Michael Brendan Doherty. Or Ross Douthat, minus the Catholicism. I mean, this really sounds so much you like know, what they're proposing. Sad that that even to know, the love I'll of Marianne to, Williamson. To, that's going to keep me up at night. I, Both of them like I just posted Williamson about too. Marianne Williamson the other day. I think it was yesterday. I said maybe she's. The I, I'm not writer. meaning this to insult you, but like I'm really not. Uh, um. Right. I mean, I, I guess I, I suspect all, you know, this is this is maybe me being some 1890s America shit. I kind of suspect all political Catholics 
of you know secretly waiting for orders from the Pope to overthrow liberal democracy. Um, so I you know I, I don't know that like they 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 don't want that. But yeah, I mean I'm I'm a Marian Williamson integralist. I think that would be. <laughs> Wow. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. So for what it's worth, I also think there is something in like, um, in, um, yeah, I think bringing people together under the spirit of like America's, the, what, what kind of vision of, of um, America's greatness can really pull people together and get them inspired again. Um, I personally like, you know, the Jeffersonian agrarian craft culture. Maybe we have, new manufacturing coming in, you get like a California table or, you know, these kinds of things where you have pride of place and, you know, the like craft brew revolution kind of thing, but for lots of other types of materials. And um, I think that there's a lot of potential in that. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think fundamentally though. Um, yeah. I th I'm, I'm really glad we had this conversation because we're struggling with this, the Doomer Optimist in general, and it's not just because we're, um, not political. I think a lot of people just gave up on politics as like the utility of it. They've just are so sick of the the celebrity politics, basically, um, and just feel like if I'm trying to put my efforts somewhere that uh, seem useful, um, somebody's going to have to prove it to me that politics are worth my time, basically. Um, and so that's kind of where we're standing. I think kind of agnostic. A lot of us. Um, and I mean, I should say personally, like uh, I I don't vote. Um, I'm not involved in any political organization. So, I mean, this, like my, my writing in the last few years is like sort of me trying to figure out out loud what I think politics should be like. And then me, like this, this is my tentative effort to, to be involved in some way. Yeah. Um, and yet, I mean, now that I've started going to church, I'm having like the terrible thought, like maybe I should be involved in like a political organization of some kind, which feels really like, ugh. But but are know. there even political organizations anymore? I think on some level, if you look at like what politics was in the 20th century, that politics doesn't really like we live in a very ape. I, I mean, I in some ways, politics seems omnipresent in some way. But in terms yeah, of yeah, actual it's, it's politics, it doesn't really but exist. Not, right. Yeah. There used yeah, yeah. to be like yeah. mass political parties and organ like that being involved in uh uh politics was this thing people actually did on every level there would be like local party organizations and so on and that just doesn't exist anymore i mean yes like the office uh, the democratic or republican party will have an office in your city if you've ever seen it it's usually this tiny little thing in a strip mall or something that no one knows where it is yeah i mean look i i am i go to an anglican church so you want to talk about dying organizations you know but <laughs> um Still, you know, uh, right. He, I mean, here's me making the case for individual agency. Um, there are probably all sorts of irreversible sociological reasons why church attendance is declining. I still, you know, it's, I can, I can in fact go on a Sunday. So like, um, I mean, there are probably irreversible reasons why mass politics is declining and maybe they're not all bad either. I don't know. You know, I'm going to be 35. It seems like, uh, it, it would be weird for me to be saying like people should engage in national politics and then like not be a member of any organization. Uh, I mean, there's some realities of the bureaucratic state that make the sort of mass politics irrelevant and electoral politics irrelevant, I think is part of it, that the, the actual functioning of government has shifted away so that it's Anyway, this is a whole nother conversation. Yes. Okay. So um, anyways, I'm going to call anyway. it. This is, I think, our longest episode, but this is so fun and great. Um, this and is please great read Blake's great. article, uh, articles on in City Journal and Unheard. The, the last article we talked about, we'll link to it. And um, read at least the preface to Christopher Lash's The Minimal Self and see uh, see where it, where it takes you. Thanks so much for joining us today, Blake. Thanks for having me. All right.